it's just about seven. So I will get started with the introductions. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Trevor Dotson. I'm the manager here at the Charlevoix Historical Society. And I want to thank you for joining one of our Zoom programs. We try to, uh, we're going to try and keep doing Zoom programs during the uh, winter and into the spring. And uh, it's just another way for us to be able to reach out to people who may not be back here in Charlevoix or uh, cannot make it down to our in-person programs. So our mission here at the uh, Charlevoix Historical Society is enriching Charlevoix culture through the preservation, education, and engaging experiences celebrating our history. And if you would like to support the Charlevoix Historical Society, please visit chxhistory.com to make a donation or become a member. You can also subscribe to our e-newsletter there if you haven't already to stay up to date on more Zoom programs and in-person programs and events. And please remember to uh, keep your microphone on mute during this program. There will be a question and answer section at the end of the program. And just one other thing, this program is being recorded, but I will stop it before the Q&A session. You can type your questions into the chat box during the program <laughs> by clicking the chat down at the bottom. And I can read those as we go through. <clears throat> so our presenter this evening is my co-curator here at the Charlevoix Historical Society, David L. Miles. David has been spreading the history of Charlevoix here for over 25 years through exhibits at the museum at Harsha House, through his programs, his popular looking back section in the Charlevoix Courier, and through his publications. He has co-authored or authored several books on uh, on Charlevoix history for the Charlevoix Historical Society. And his most recent book is called Boulders, The Life and Creations of Earl A. Earl a. Young in Charlevoix, Michigan. This book has received two awards from the state of Michigan, the Library of Michigan selected as one of the 20 notable books of the year, and the Historical Society of Michigan recently granted Boulders a state history award in the book's private printing category. So with that, I will now turn it over to David Miles, and he will tell you about another popular Charlevoixian, his father, Bob Miles. Well, thank you very much for being with us. <clears throat> this program is on my father, Bob Miles, Charlevoix photographer for 42 years, and the town's unofficial historian for about half that time. What you are going to see is a synopsis of his life, much of it within a specific time in Charlevoix, using mostly his own photographs, family photos, and historical photos that came into his possession. This will encapsulate a period that comprised about one third of Charlevoix's existence at the time he retired in 1972. Almost all the photos used in the section on his adult life will be his. <clears throat> My father was born in Lupton, Michigan on March 21st, 1902, with photography in his DNA. Lupton is a little town in Ogama County, northwest of West Branch at the Arrow. He was the third child and second son of Clarence Miles, a native of Ohio, whose own father, Cornelius Miles, worked in a photo studio in Camden near Dayton, and Edna Appleby Miles whose father, William Walker Appleby, was a professional photographer also in Camden, then Hamilton, north of Cincinnati, and finally Kansas City, Missouri. She learned the photographer's trade at her father's knee. In the 1890s, she helped out with the developing and printing when he returned from his travels to state fairs where he took penny tin type pictures. <clears throat> William died of pneumonia in 19, 1898, sorry. So she wrote to Clarence Miles, whom she had known in Camden, to ask if he could come to Missouri and help out. He did, and they ended up getting married. Two children followed, then my father in 1902, eventually in nine. Here they all are at the 1947 family reunion, minus the fourth born, Lauren, who died at age 25 in 1929. They, in turn, produced a slew of excellent cousins, with two more slated to fill the picture. Dad is at the green arrow, I'm lower at the blue one. In 1901, my grandfather, an electrician by training, followed his brother John to Lupton to work in the lumber industry, where he found a position as a railroad dispatcher responsible for sending out timber. 
but he became enchanted with the silent movies and in 1908 moved the family about five miles west to Rose City. There he was burned out of two theaters. Discouraged, he decided to take a chance on northern Michigan, where he heard there was both a lumber mill and a theater to manage in East Jordan. Now with six children, in 1911, the, the Mileses took the train to our neighbor to the south, where Clarence did find work in its mill and also was able to manage the theater, located in the large Kitzman's building on the east side of Main Street, called the Temple. But he didn't get along with the building's owner and wanted a place of his own. Hearing the five-year-old Majestic Theater in Charlevoix would be up for lease soon, in 1913, now with seven kids in tow, the Mileses went down to the East Jordan waterfront and boarded the little steamer home at Upper Center. To my father at age 11, this was the adventure of a lifetime because he had never been on a boat. He was enthralled with everything he saw coming up what was then called Pine Lake. When the hum neared Charlevoix, in his own words, the first thing that met my eyes was the old sugar beet factory located at the site of Irish Boat Shop. It looked to my child's eye like an old medieval castle out of a storybook. That first magic moment seemed to intensify as we neared the railroad bridge and started through the upper channel. As we entered Round Lake, I was overwhelmed by the boats that seemed to be all around. Fish tugs, rowboats, schooners, power boats, sailboats, and tied up at Wilbur's dock was the huge Manitou. I could never disengage myself from the magic of that day. Thus it began, a love affair with Charlevoix that never ended. They wouldn't have docked at this site, currently the Beaver Island Boat Company dock, but instead, all Lake Charlevoix steamers went to the Mason Street dock, where fortuitously, this photo shows the hum pulling out at far right. This is what my father looked like soon after the family arrived in Charlevoix. <coughs> Before the majestic lease would have free up on December 31st, my grandfather began by showing movies in the 1883 Lewis Grand Opera House by the bridge, called by then a Nickelodeon after the cinema began to edge out live stage productions and tickets were only five cents. The majestic across the street at the Arrow had been owned by our famous builder in stone, Earl Young's father, along with two other men since 1909. That's Adolph Young's insurance agency, agency at Far Right. And where exactly was the theater? Facing up Park Avenue. If you drove east on Park and didn't stop, you'd go into the front door. While he kept his hand in at the opera house, the Majestic opened under my grandfather at the beginning of the new year in 1914 with Pritchard's select players presenting the stage production, He Fell in Love with His Wife, a play of universal and appealing interest. The live theater schedule would soon be interspersed with silent movies three days a week. At first, the facade had a primitive exterior with its birch bark and stick box office and stick and latticework trim. <clears throat> Two signs mounted on two wood poles were placed by the street. You can see the words vaudeville and motion pictures on the right one. My father and his older brother Walker learned how to operate the projector. My talented grandmother and, her da and dad's older sister Elsie played the piano accompaniments for the silence, improvising when need be as they went along with the movie's plot if the sheet music hadn't been included in the film canister. They also manned the box office, and my grandfather was general factotum. Somewhere along the line, the exterior was modernized with a more substantial box office. In 1920, the comedy Officer 666 was showing. I hope that wasn't the biblical mark of the beast. If you look closely at the postings at far left, Ringling Brothers is coming to Petoskey. My grandfather was determined to show only wholesome family entertainment in an era that even then had his share of what would be laughably tame by today's standards, but was considered to be quite racy back then. 
The Miles family lived in three different Charlevoix houses. In every house, my father watched and learned as his mother continued to do photographic work in the kitchen, which doubled as a dark room into which the other children were forbidden to enter while she was working. <clears throat> he obtained a small box camera and started to take, develop, and print snapshots himself. He became so practiced and proficient that by 1922, now with a bigger and better camera, he went down to Old River below the Chicago Club Resort off Round Lake and did a series on the resort swan flock that were the ancestors of all the mute swans to be found in Northern Michigan. But the three years before he took these photos had been ones of upheaval. Ever since he arrived, Bob had to leave school periodically to work both at the theater and to help bring money in for the family doing part-time jobs. School attendance requirements were lax back then as kids reached early legal working age and he, he kept falling behind. Competition in the form of the new Palace Theater built by Mr. Moon of Petoskey, half a block south did my grandfather in. My Aunt Janice's memoirs claim to tell why. Dad lost so many of his customers he couldn't make enough money to live on. Dad had always been selective with the pictures he showed, but Mr. Moon showed rather trashy pictures because he took anything they sent him from the cheapest film company. By 1919, my grandfather, Elsie Walker, and my father left for Muskegon to work in the Brunswick Tire Bowling Pin and Bowling, pin and bowling Ball Factory. My grandmother, with the assistance of Lauren, age 15, and whose education also was running behind, tried to run the theater, but was all over by El was all over by the end of 1920, and the rest of the family moved downstate the following year. Later in 1921, my father, fed up with factory life, returned to Charlevoix. He wanted to finish his high school education here, which he did at the age of 21, and stayed with friends. He played on the 1922 and 1923 basketball team and was business manager of the Harlequin, the class yearbook the same school year. The quote chosen to accompany his photo said, and still the wonder grew that one small head could carry all he knew. That was an understatement because he never stopped reading and learning. Not happy with the Harlequin photo, which he said made him look like he was ready to fall asleep. He had this one taken in 1923 by local photographer, George Priest, and considered it to be his official graduation image. <clears throat> Ever since he returned to Charlevoix, he worked two jobs. One, ironically, for the man who put his father out of business, but who needed a projectionist, and my father needed the money. His main job was at Pheasanton's Drugstore, formerly Heinz Drugs in the Carpenter Building at left, located where the East Park Performance Pavilion is today. Mr. Heinz had, agreement, had an agreement with Mr. Fessenden that stipulated he could return every summer to work as long as he wanted because he enjoyed Charle Charlevoix so much in the peak season. After dad locked up the theater, he would come into the store to help out on the late shift that sometimes lasted until one in the morning during which times he would pump Mr. Hines for stories of the early days for Mr. Hines, as he said, could make past events come alive with his keen memory and sharp wit. By 1922, Mr. Pheasant moved up to the Park Avenue corner where he called the store Pills and Things. In March of 1925, Pills and Things, along with the rest of the large building, was severely damaged by fire. Rather than wait for rebuilding, Mr. Fessenden and my father moved again, this time up to the Mason Street corner and into the Masonic building. During the 20s, one of New York City's most prominent society photographers set up shop in Charlevoix to capitalize on the wealth that poured in here from all over the country. His name was Baron Callan, double R, double L. He took a liking to my father, recognizing his potential after dad showed him the swan photos plus other work he had done. Callan took this of Oscar Wilbur, the captain of the passenger steamer City of Grand Rapids, which had called for here for years and after whom Wilbur's dock seen previously was named. 
Notice how Callan signed his name in a vertical pattern. He took these of my father, again, notice the signatures, one done with a red wax pencil. Callan encouraged him to seriously consider becoming a professional photographer, but it took a while before dad took him up on it. In 1926, Frank Hines at left gave him the first photo of what would grow into what we now call the Bob Miles photo collection. <coughs> In dad's own words, Knowing that my family came to Shalloway on the hum, he gave me a picture of the yacht Pilgrim, which became the hum, entering Lake, Lake Shalloway on her way to East Jordan. Upon looking back, it was possibly the possession of this one picture, plus my association with Mr. Hines, that aroused in me an interest, interest in the early days of Shalloway. In the late 30s, he obtained an original colored lithograph of the 1889 Lubo aerial insurance map of Charlevoix. Then just before World War II, he came into possession of two 1887 images of the burned Champlain at the South Pier, our worst maritime disaster with the loss of 22 lives, a story worthy of a program in itself. And that was it. By 1957, the collected photo history of Charlevoix could be placed in one five by seven envelope. At the end of the 1926 season, after he saved enough money by adding a third job with a package delivery service, dad left Charlevoix and went to Western State Normal School, now Western Michigan University in Kalamazoo with the intention of becoming a teacher of history and literature. When he returned to Charlevoix over the summer of 1928, he took this and one other of our stupendous The Inn Hotel, built in 1889, I'm sorry, 1898, at the far end of East Dixon Avenue, overlooking Lake Charlevoix. He just kept getting better. At Western, he kept at a sport interest until he developed into a crack tennis player and made the team that rose to take the state tennis championship of 1929. But it was then that he realized there were too many teachers and not enough jobs. So his first love took over and won out to the dismay of his family where he would have been the only one to obtain a college degree. He headed for New York City and the New York Institute of Photography where he arrived just in time for the stock market crash. He managed to keep body and soul together over 1930 and complete the curriculum returning to Charlevoix in April of 1931. In May, he set up a studio in a little house at 314 Antrim Street, still there. This was the first portrait he took of Carl Erber, who owned the local Ford dealership and garage. Look how dad signed his name in a pattern like his mentor, Baron Callum, whom he had frequently visited when he was in New York. This was the first child's portrait he took, also in 1931, identified as only Miss Wolf. He loved the challenge of taking children's photos. In 1932, he moved downtown to where the sunglass shop is today, <clears throat> behind the awning at left, where he stayed for a couple of years. Even with the depression in full swing, his summertime business was able to see him through the year. Never having been the domestic type, they, dad ate all of his meals up the street at Montmother's Cafe, today's Gaga for Kids and Murdoch's Fudge, which in the 1920s was reputed to have had its slot machines provided by the Detroit Purple Gang. He began producing postcards, but his initial attempts at top were nothing to write home about. They could be too dark, too full of contrast, not enough detail, too fuzzy or printed at an angle, but he quickly got his bearings and began to produce high quality black and white work until the late 1940s, some of which have become our classic images. He even brought forward his 1922 swans and on almost all the cards appeared his Charlevoix the Beautiful graphic design. One thing that had never given him any qualms was climbing the water tower that once stood on the Park Avenue bluff. He'd done it since he was a boy. So with cameras slung around his neck, 
he went up like a fly climbing a wall and perched on the rail that surrounded the tank. Below and to the right, you can see the beach hotel. He took many of his best shots up here, several of them looking toward North Point and Mount McSaba, with a beach hotel here with its large white annex and cottages in the foreground. One of the best he ever took of the passenger liner North American was from the tower. And this of the mighty Manitou circling, beginning to circle into the city dock. My dad also had a devilish side to him. He took one of his tower views and superimposed upon it a snow-capped volcano looming over the far side of Lake Charlevoix. He made this into a postcard and put it into the rack outside the Bridge Street store where he loved to stand inside and watch the startled reactions of people who browsed the cards. In either 1934 or certainly by early 1935, he had moved from Bridge Street to 209 Park Avenue into a little house that stood behind the house on the street seen here and below the tower hotel on the bluff next to the water tower. All these years, my father had known local girl Esther Goldstick only at a distance since they ran in different social circles because there was a 10 year difference in their ages. This is her high, 1930 high school graduation picture, also taken by George Priest. One of her girlfriends had my father take a portrait Christmas greeting card and Esther, nicknamed Aby, long story, thought that was a nice idea. In late 1934, she had one made also. Something clicked besides the camera shutter. Bob asked if he could do her formal portrait. She agreed returned and sat for him while he was hunched over under the dark cloth hood that shielded the rest of the camera or the rear of the camera and looked at her image upside down in the viewing glass. He said to himself, that's the girl I'm going to marry. So he did, after again signing the photo like he'd been doing over three years. They dated all of 1935 and Bob and A.B. set the date for December 21st that year. They were married at 8.30 in the evening at the Congregational Church Parsonage on State Street, called, according to the Charlevoix Courier, popular members of the younger social set. Earlier that year, in February of 1935, appeared the photo that was to become his signature image. A tremendous storm had passed. The temperature stood at minus two, and the wind was howling off Lake Michigan. He drove down to the beach, could hardly open the car door against the wind, propped his camera on the car's top, struggling to keep it steady, and waited in the bone-chilling cold for the right wave to break over the South Pier. When it did, just before he released the shutter, the clouds opened to let the sun burst through and bathe the scene in a brilliant light. To many people, Bob Miles caught in that split second the spirit and essence of Charlevoix forever. He made over 1,500 prints of this, hand-colored about 500, and they can be found all over the world, such as Japan, Egypt, New Zealand, Germany, and England. Four months later, the Hotel Charlevoix burned to a shell next door to my grandfather Goldstick's shoe hospital, fortunately spared. In its place went up the Fort Stockade pageantorium for the county homecoming festivities, where our first Venetian festival queen, Marge Carey, was crowned. And after that came out, began the planning and 1937-1939 development of our crown jewel, East Park, which so many untold hundreds of thousands have enjoyed to this day. My late brother, Bob Jr., was born in fall of 1936. This inaugurated a series of Christmas cards, but I will not bore you with looking at my brother than the two of us and how we grew. But I will show you the first one of us together <clears> in <throat> 1940 because we got to ride in one of the swans. The series lasted until Bob went to Michigan State in 1954. This composite of all of them is from that year. While my mother was pregnant with my younger brother, they realized that the little house wouldn't do. So dad set his eyes on 109 Park Avenue, half a block east where his good friend Dick Hammett once lived. 
he was familiar with it. And as they say, location is everything. Dick's father had lost the house and its beautiful grounds in the Depression in 1932. It was now in the hands of the Shalway State Savings Bank. My father was not a pushy type, but once he got his mind set on something, there was no stopping him. He pestered Archie Livingston, bank president, until Archie, just to get rid of him, said, Bob, I'll make you a deal. You come up with $1,000. I'll take $1,000 off the $5,000 asking price, and that will leave you with a $3,000 mortgage. So dad went to work, called in all his invoices, borrowed from family and friends where he could. And when he handed Archie the envelope with the money in it, all he and my mother had as their total assets were one house plus 19 cents. My parents couldn't move in right away because there were renters involved. So they had to honor the leases, but at least that was income. Once the downstairs and two of the upstairs renters moved out in late 1937, they moved in and inherited in the small upstairs east side apartment, Minnie Payton, Charlevoix's beloved librarian who walked to work a block away to Clinton Street. Minnie became my earliest BFF, my best friend forever, before she retired and left us after seven years for California in late 1944. Here snapped by my father just before the train arrived, one of the finest people ever walked the earth. So 109 Park Avenue became the Bob Miles studio for the next 35 years. In 1935, I'm sorry, 39, <clears throat> my father obtained what would become the workhorse of his career, the universally used speed graphic camera, which is currently on exhibit at the Harsha House, and with which we he took practically everything of importance outside the studio. Rare was the time he left the house without it. This is the first photo, my mother at that time, three months along with me. And on Valentine's Day, 1940, I burst onto the scene. Now comes the magical moment you've all been waiting for. My baby pictures. There's hundreds of them. But before you vote for the exits, I promise to be merciful and show you only one of a rather unusual pose that you're not likely to find anywhere else. In April of 1941, Dad caught the final voyage of the magnificent 191-foot Sylvia that had made Charlevoix its home port since 1930. This is one of his all-time greats. <clears throat> Sensing what was coming in an increasingly troubled world, six months before Pearl Harbor, her owner donated his prized possession to the federal government, knowing he would she would probably be confiscated for war duty later. He was right. Here the Sylvia is on her way east through the upper channel. And no, this is not shown backwards. The American flag on the hull at center was painted that way to resemble a flag flying from the rear flagpole. <clears throat> right after he snapped, snapped this, Dad raced to the airport to fly up with pilot Joe McPhillips to catch the Sylvia's farewell voyage down Lake Charlevoix, suspecting she would never return, and she never did. Not long after Dad captured Charlevoix County State Bank President Bob Bridge, then mayor, in his office looking over plans for a new bridge we were expecting to be getting within months to replace this badly aged old one from 1901. But then Pearl Harbor did come along. The plans Mr. Bridge is shown holding were put in the basement of City Hall for six more years. That same fall of 1941, the Inn Hotel closed for good, having been killed by the Depression and the advent of the automobile for which it would provide very little parking. All the contents went up for auction. My father obtained these four pillars, two of the diamond paned windows, a section of the frieze, and many of the balusters plus a mirror for $64. The pillars and frieze became the backdrop for his studio and are still in the house as is the mirror in the downstairs hallway. Then the pride of Charlevoix came down. He said the days he spent recording its demise were some of the saddest ones in his life for he knew that the town would never see its like again. 
In 1942, the 19th chapter of the Society for the Preservation of Barbershop Quartet Singing in America was formed in Charlevoix. <clears throat> Thus began over a decade of Labor Day weekend jamborees in the school gym, now the library stacks, considered nationwide to be some of the best of their kind, including in their roster current and former national champions. They were enormous undertakings, and my folks were in the thick of it every year. There were always clever thematic designs on the gym stage. My father had a nice tenor voice and loved to sing barbershop. My brother once told me that someone told him he knew about a picture of dad dressed in a bathroom and standing near a bathtub. What was that all about? I knew immediately what was being referred to. Amongst other groups, he sang in the Saturday Nighters. The group named themselves after the night you got together to sing and also take your weekly bath. An artist friend even did their caricatures from the photo. In June of 1943, the 343-foot passenger steamer Milwaukee Clipper made her one and only entrance into Round Lake. There was only one place to put her, but the city dock was only so long. That proved inconvenient since she had to nose across the channel almost to the sunken pilings of the lumber company, which gesture blocked the channel shut for a few hours. The clipper was so big that if you stood on the channel bridge, you could not see Round Lake. The reason she had to sit like this, the boat's gangway was toward the rear of the vessel. So once was enough. My brother and I watched her leave and never came back. In 1945, our fourth school built in 1889 came down. This is now the parking lot of the Charlevoix Public Library. <clears throat> After the war, it was time for a major remodeling job. We moved all the living quarters upstairs and almost the whole downstairs was turned over to portrait studio, storage and display in this room and two dark rooms and work areas. Several years after that, now that we had an upstairs shower, this downstairs water guzzler went to the dump to be replaced by a washer and dryer. Imagine my parents' dismay when they later discovered what valuable collectors and restoration items these lion's, tub, lion's claw tubs had become. One amusing incident during the redo was the four of us driving home from a Sunday excursion and finding three women near the back door seated on the old and discarded water tank. They apparently had been walking down Park Avenue and walked up the drive to rest their feet. Dad had a camera with him and snapped the photo without their knowing. We walked past them and into the back door, nodding greetings to each other and they never moved. The post-war era was when my father began his relationship with our master creator in stone, Earl Young, then midway through his own career, and they became quite good friends. This is Earl's second personal residence, built 1946-1947. From 1947 to 49, Bob captured the first of four major area projects that kept him in thrall. We finally got our new bridge and the sequence he captured over those two years is irreplaceable. Around this time, a chunk of wooded hilly land east of Boyne City began to turn into a ski resort called Boyne Mountain and was oddly succeeding. Practically everyone around here thought the man behind it, Everett Kircher, was bonkers. We all know how that turned out. My father went over and introduced, and introduced himself with the idea that what Mr. Kircher needed were postcards to spread the word further. Post-war technology had improved color photography to the point he was giving up black and white. He showed Mr. Kircher his recent work and got the contract. So every year in all seasons, he returned and chronicled the initial growth of that amazing place. Also in the early 1950s came the coup of the century. What many dream of achieving, evidence of other life in the universe. Bob Miles, the right man in the right place at the right time, camera always at the ready, captured forever, a squadron of flying saucers hovering over our town, proof that there are aliens among us, four orange support vessels and the red mothership, 
complete with suspended observation and command module. He turned this into one of his best-selling postcards on the back of which he divulged the secrets he had uncovered about them. We all know resorters come from all over the country to summer here, but did you know Mars? Who else can claim that? Okay, okay, you're saying to yourselves, what's the gimmick? How is it done? The next image will give a clue. He turned scrap lumber at the arrow at top right into a jerry-built scaffolding about three feet square and over six feet high. About five feet off the ground, he horizontally placed a square window pane. One of my childhood toys was still kicking around the house from which he removed the wheels and to these he glued 10 of my mother's darning needles. He placed the wheels on the glass in perfect formation, sat under it and focused the speed graphic upwards to catch the phenomenon forever. Of course, we got a good laugh out of the success of the postcard and the not few reactions from true believers who couldn't thank him enough for this irrefutable proof that the many saucer sightings of the paranoid early Cold War times were for real. Really. On March 28, 1952, the whole town turned out to honor our favorite sons, fraternal twins Bill and Bob Carey, younger brothers of our first Venetian queen, who were two of the finest athletes our schools ever produced. Bob earned a record 12 letters at Michigan State, which I believe still stands, and went on to play for the Los Angeles Rams, for whom he was the number one draft choice in the Chicago Bears. <clears throat> Here they are receiving the keys to the city with track coach Stuart Coleman at left, MSU head coach Biggie Munn, who said of Bob, he is the greatest all-around athlete I've ever seen or hoped to see, and our own legendary football and basketball coach Ray Kipke on the right. The day included a huge parade downtown and a community banquet in a school gym that night. 200 were expected to appear. Over 300 showed up and the food ran out. In 1954, Earl Young had my father do a series of photos of the construction of his brand new weather vane inn, which when it opened that year, became the sensation of the North. Two years after that, camera in hand, he slogged uphill to capture views from our brand new Mount McSavis, McSavis Ski Hill, turning this one <clears throat> to Big Rock Point and beyond to Little Traverse Bay into another postcard. Then came a seismic shift, an epiphany, if you will, that altered his perception of what he should be doing. <clears throat> it was nothing dramatic, merely a passing mention of an event, but the result of that may well be the reason why a Charlevoix Historical Society is flourishing today. In his own words, from 1926 to 1956, the number of old pictures in my possession regarding Charlevoix had risen to three. In the meantime, there was a collection of about a dozen old originals owned by a merchant who displayed them in his store. When he died, his collection was scattered to the four winds for all practical purposes lost forever. <clears throat> about the same time, I learned of a man from downstate who had just purchased a farm a few miles south of Charlevoix. In the attic of the farmhouse, he had found a large box containing dozens of old photographs of Charlevoix. He had taken them outside and burned them. When asked why he burned them, he said they meant nothing to him, were in the way, they were trash. Up to that time, I had had a feeling of indifference toward Charlevoix's old photographs myself. But at this point, I experienced a sudden, almost feverish concern at the thought of what was taking place that part of our very heritage was being blotted out forever. So that's how it began as it had been struck by lightning. He sent out a plea for donations or he would make copies and return them. The result was overwhelming. He never knew so much of our town still existed in attics, albums, closets, envelopes, drawers. It was like Niagara Falls. Thus began a project that would see him through two decades and culminate in seven leather-bound volumes of an illustrated history of Charlevoix. 
<clears throat> the project began with his own three photos displayed on a board downtown, at which time he let it be known he would be interested in anything anyone had to offer. The project snowballed beyond my wildest dreams, he wrote. Before the summer was over, most every store in town had a display of old pictures, and I had a file of hundreds of negatives. At this point, my interest and in work took off like a jet. Then became the gargantuan task of winnowing, organizing, and dating where possible, then writing up what he discovered, sometimes spending weeks to verify one detail. He dove into local history. Of this, he wrote, it took a year of asking, begging, and bribing to get the one picture known to exist of the collapse of the Inn Hotel construction in 1897, <clears throat> one of the classics of our collection. His friend Bob Burns gave him a priceless trove of 350 <clears throat> glass plate negatives assembled from the collections of earlier Charlevoix photographers by photographer Ernest, Ernest Peasley, who was active in Charlevoix around the turn of the last century. Shown are a handful of the unidentified portraits, some with faces that I have glimpsed in other Charlevoix photos, but I have no idea who they are. And it's beautifully composed when taken in Charlevoix, but I have no idea where. Here is a swift overview of others in that collection. It was during this time that he also became engaged in the next big project that held him enthralled, another bridge, but this one much bigger than ours. For his second consuming interest, <clears throat> my father had to witness every phase of the construction of the Mackinac Bridge in the mid-1950s. We drove up to the streets frequently where he captured a sequence of construction shots to completion, then from all angles, including that striking, beautiful aerial at bottom. On that particular day, he was up because he'd heard that the liner South American was at Mackinac Island and wanted to capture her on her way to Chicago. He got her after she passed under the bridge, looking like her mass had just had enough clearance. But that was an illusion. This other photo of her under the bridge shows how it dwarfed any vessel that passed below. Here's the boat in relation to our bridge. In 1959, Dad caught the first waterfront art fair, pretty bare bones compared to what it was, has grown into today. And at the same time, a new county building ready to open, just as he has snapped its predecessor, <clears throat> where Ernest, Ernest Hemingway had walked in at the Arrow on September 1st, 1921, to obtain his marriage license or affidavit for marriage to his first wife, Hadley Richardson. If you would like to see these original documents with Hemingway's signature, we have them at the Harsha House. Also at this time, 1959, <clears throat> the Lodge Motel, now the expanded Hotel Earl, opened its doors. Dad continued with his bread and butter postcard businesses, but didn't just stick with Charlevoix. He went all over Northern Michigan with a particular fondness for Petoskey. Note its winter ice spectacular at lower right. He even got as far east as Alpena and south to Traverse City and Cadillac. <clears throat> This postcard was distributed by the thousands. By the Big Rock Point, by Big Rock Point, four miles away, the first nuclear plant in Michigan and the fifth in the United States and has gone all over the world. This was a third of the major projects that my father couldn't get enough of and consumers power indulged him. Even before the first reactor was installed or the reactor was installed, Big Rock had an information center up and running in 1961. <clears throat> By the time it closed in 1973, during the economic crisis that year, over one million people had visited Big Rock and Charlevoix. Dad photographed inside and out, even on top of the reactor housing, both before the plant went online and during operations, and captured the meeting of man-made and natural nuclear fission in this beautiful shot. He had many times taken one of his favorites, the Belvedere Hotel, here in its prime, 
when it hosted people from all over the country, including Edgar Rice Burroughs, the creator of Tarzan, and the untouchable himself, Elliot Ness, but not as beautiful on the inside, rather austere. And its final days in late 1960, when it had to come down because redoing it up to snuff would have been cost prohibitive. So here only the elevator shaft is left standing. <clears throat> In 1964, he caught the extremely low springtime water in Old River by the Chicago Club. There was a real hazard to navigation that year as seen by the club boathouse high and almost dry on Round Lake. But he must have, we must have had a lot of rain and snow later that year and winter because in 1965, Earl Young asked him to snap himself and his wife Irene as they reconstructed their courting days on Old River in the same canoe in which he had popped the question 50 years before. Also that year, he snapped Earl's latest creation, the Weathervane Terrace Motel. Now it was time for the fourth and final major project that made my father like a kid with his hand in the cookie jar. The construction of the Medusa cement plant on South Point. In the mid sixties, Medusa hired him to chronicle the entire construction project. When I first saw the negatives owned by the company well over a decade ago, my heart skipped a couple of beats. I knew he was good. I just didn't know he was that good. From the aerial shots of South Point before anything was touched through to dedication day, he was there. Even capturing the first shipment of coal to power the complex in May of 1967 and the lower shot of the completed plant ready to go one of the finest industrial photographs I'd ever seen. <clears throat> in late spring of 1971, he took this of an unprotected weather vane in, which had lost much of its natural support in a gigantic three-day storm the previous November that washed out soil up to the building's foundations. It was predicted that without drastic preventive measures by the federal government, the weather vane was sure to slide into the channel sometime soon. Aware of the crisis, Dad had rummaged through that priceless trove of gl glass plate navigators because he remembered one photo vividly and printed it out the <clears throat> for the three distraught men who now own the building and to Earl and to, for them to send it on as one last ditch effort to a stubborn Army Corps of Engineers to prevent disaster. The photo proved that the government had originally begun <clears throat> begun excuse me, had originally been responsible for providing uninterrupted revetment from the end of the pier all the way to Round Lake. The foot dragging and stonewalling Army Corps of Engineers, which since the 1930s had insisted it was not responsible for waterside production in front of commercial property, finally had to relent once they were faced with the historical evidence. Work like this started in the summer just weeks after the photo was mailed in and was completed by November. That old photo alone is the reason we still have the weather vane. <clears throat> Dad had begun to ease off as the 1960s proceeded. As the decade ended, he took only those jobs that interested him and looked forward to retirement. In 1971, he completed the first volume of his illustrated history of Charlevoix and presented it to the Charlevoix Public Library with each succeeding volume following annually until he finished the project. Around this time, he also became interested in goofing around with stones. He started making what he called milestones simply for the pleasure of doing so. He gave them whimsical names and gave them away to whoever oohed and odd over them, building up quite a collection in the process. This led into an infatuation with working with Petoskey stones, which resulted in some very clever creations and culminated in the maddest thing he ever did. He officially retired on December 31st, 1972, and needed something to fill his time. The nation's bicentennial was coming up. <clears throat> so he got the brilliant idea of constructing a 200 story tower that visually depicted our nation's history entirely out of Petoskey stones. The project took nearly four years. Every stone gathered, cut, machined, tumbled, polished, and engineered into a 235 pound, eight foot tall, whatchamacallit, 
He had it ready by mid-1976. The tower was displayed in a few places and now resides in its own corner at the Harsha House Museum. I never, never want to have to take it apart and put its eight sections back together again. Then came the climactic event of his enormously productive life. All this time, he had been putting the finishing touches on his history of Charlevoix and placing each leaf into five sets of seven leather-bound volumes. <clears throat> in 1975, as he was nearing the end of nearly two decades of work, the Charlevoix Historical Society approached him regarding the possibility of using selected pages to publish a history book in honor of the bicentennial and to raise funds for the construction of a then badly needed museum. Dad was sympathetic with the idea, but extremely pessimistic because of the $18,000 expense and borrowed funds involved for a book that would cost $20 free or 25 post publication. This was when a novel could be had for less than $10. Plus he didn't think there would be enough people around interested to justify the effort. He even feared for the society's survival just three years after it had reorganized. But he gave us permission for the project with the stipulation he had nothing to do with it. The desired pages were selected, copied, and published. The 247-page Bob Miles Charlevoix came out in a limited edi edition of 2000 and 1976, and you never saw anyone so willing to consume humble pie. To his astonishment, his misgivings proved unfounded and his name went all over the country. The response was so enthusiastic that publication costs were recouped almost at once. Within three years, enough revenue, almost $40,000, had been raised to construct the museum edition that wraps around the Harsha House in 1980. As a result of that success, in October of 1981, at a banquet downstate, <clears throat> the Historical Society of Michigan presented Bob Miles with its award of merit to acknowledge his invaluable contribution to the preservation of the history of Charlevoix. He said it was one of the proudest moments of his life. My mother said after they returned that when he was asked to say a few words, he was so overcome he couldn't speak. Bob Miles Charlevoix sold out in 1986. So imagine how dumbfounded he would be now to learn that the book was commanding up to $500 on eBay. <clears throat> he spent the remaining five years of his life quietly, but the heart condition that had begun in his late 40s finally caught up with him, and he passed away at age 84 on May 8, 1986. In his honor, a plaque was mounted on a rock in this small shaded garden area on the Harsha House lawn. It contains only a few words, donated by Keep Charlevoix Beautiful, Beautiful in fond memory of Bob Miles, simple enough, just as he would have wanted. You've seen his life story in tandem with the story of Charlevoix as he developed along with him over those four professional decades. What he gave to posterity is nothing short of astonishing because nothing in Charlevoix and the region was foreign to it. Its range and scope captured in his trademark crisp focus and balanced composition. You are now and have been in Charlevoix the Beautiful from the sublime seen here through subject after subject after subject after subject to a culmination with the ridiculous. Our next door neighbor, Ralph Washburn's Long Johns blowing in the wind. What you have seen tonight is a drop in the bucket compared to what the Charlevoix Historical Society possesses of his work, a treasure trove beyond compare. I don't think my father even came close to realizing the extent and importance of what he left to and did for this town. In retrospect, perhaps it's a good thing that that unknown man burned through those unwanted photographs in the 1950s. As a result, Bob Miles had a revelation. As they say, one door closes, another one opens. Look at what that door opened upon and what we have to work with today. As a result, in 2017, 
Bob Miles was inducted into the Charlevoix High School Hall of Fame. One last image. After all you've seen and all you realize that I have seen, you might ask, what is my favorite of anything he ever did? It's from the early 1930s of the Manitou Shoals Lightship, one station near North Manitou Island off the Leelanau Peninsula to our southwest that used to winter in Charlevoix in the upper channel. Here he captured her one early spring day on her way back to Lake Michigan duty. My candidate for the most beautiful photo Bob Miles ever took. Don't ask me why, it just is. I hope you enjoyed tonight's program and thank you all so much for joining in. Thank you very much, David. Great job as usual.